Joe has bought some uh, Lacerta Billionaire to the Western Green Lizard from us um, that are going in this incredible enclosure and we're going to give you a rundown of the enclosure in this video because if you're going to keep indoors, which we don't necessarily recommend, you know, we prefer people to keep outdoors, then this is the way you do it. I mean, this enclosure is incredible. Joe used actual habitat shots that he's vis visited himself to inform the plan of the enclosure. So, here's Joe. <laughs> So Joe, the elephant in the room and the setup that we've come to see is this incredible enclosure for Lacerta Billionato, a trio which we've bred for you. Joe has got possibly 1.2 in here and we will later on talk about the legislation surrounding the keeping and acquisition of this European protected species. But before that, Joe is just going to give us a rundown of this enclosure. Well, I'm certainly glad that you like it. Uh, this enclosure is approximately four foot one long from side to side, two feet from front to back, and two foot four tall. Starting off at the bottom of it, you can see that there is lots of leaf litter in there, and this was an informed inclusion into the vivarium because I found a document entitled something along the lines of ecotonal selection in Lacerta bilineata, and that was saying that these lizards prefer to live in environments that are sort of transitions between one habitat and another and that is what we call an ecotone and they do prefer ecotones which have leaf litter have you seen them in the wild or anything i'm not sure if you said that you have is does this like marry up with your findings as a matter of fact joe yes i have and i've been to the wild on many occasions to study these animals and one thing that i can really say is how well this viv simulates the wild you know, following nature's example. One thing worth noting is how you will often see adults basking within the leaf litter of which you've provided, just off from the path, knowing almost to camouflage against it. And then they'll hug small plants, sort of green, you know, shoots from trees or whatever, uh, just like a chameleon would blend into a bush. And, and what's funny is how people will often just walk right past them without he, any inkling that they're there. You know, these little dragons looking right up at people, usually beachgoers. An interesting note with the juveniles is how they are sort of an off-brown, grey-green, as compared to the vibrant grass-green of the adults, maybe suggesting a different niche within the environment. You know, juveniles may sort of live, you know, specialise within leaf litter, where small inverts are, such as springtails. Well, I suppose that that is actually incorporated in this enclosure too, because it is bioactive and so all of the invertebrate custodians that I've added to this enclosure do hang out in the leaf litter. Uh, so there are four species of wood lice that are put in. There is Porcellio levis orange, the giant orange isopod, and Porcellionides prurinosis, prurinosis, the tropical grey isopod. There is Porcellio scaba, the common rough wood louse, Aniscus ocellus, the white spotted common woodlouse, I think, and there's possibly a couple of Philoscia muscorum as well. And then, of course, there are a range of different springtails that I've, some of them have introduced and some have come in on the wood, and there are also earthworms. Uh, going just above this as well, you will notice that there are different plants in this enclosure and I suppose they replicate a bit of the natural environment too. Uh, there's an azalea, there's a lavender which isn't doing so well, uh, there's some um, weeds and things that have propagated from outside, there's like the little black currant bush which thanks Harvey for IDing that for me. Um, I suppose that is one of the things about collecting weeds from outside actually, is that when you don't know the names of them, for me it does add to the sort of wild look of the enclosure because obviously if you were going and surveying these animals in the wild you basically don't know the names of things and I suppose that's a little bit of charm in this vivarium for me but yeah the lizards already do seem to be enjoying the plants climbing up them and that. 
I think the most amazing part of this setup Joe has created is the wonderful 3D background made from real stone and cork bark. And what we were saying earlier is how adding an intricate background like this increases the usable space for our animals. You know, ecological roughness is the term for the livable surface area for an organism. I think we need to part ways of thinking about varium as sort of length by width by height and instead consider the livable space our animals can actually live on. Well, yeah, exactly. You bang on there. People go on and on and on about how you need like a 40 gallon for this species or 120 gallon for this species, 10 gallon for this one, blah, 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 blah. But the thing is, at the end of the day, reptiles and amphibians are reptiles and amphibians and they want to walk around on surfaces. They're not just fish occupying the volume. So when we do get a large en larger enclosure, which is fundamentally just an empty box, we need to work with it to sculpt it into something that the animals are able to use. And that is what the background's all about. So basically what it is, is just black painted MDF boards, cut to the appropriate sizes, with bits of cork bark put onto them just with screws going through the back of the mdf out the other side and then penetrating into the wood now i couldn't do that so simply with the rocks because they are so heavy so on my channel like i showed you how i made all of this background and it was quite a lengthy process but again with the rocks what it required was some screws going down through the slates um, going through holes that I'd made in the slates using a sharp ended chisel and they go down into little blocks of wood which are then hanged onto the MDF board at the back using corner brackets and then in between those I did wedge the larger white stones which is called Cotswold stone I think from where I bought it from like the builder's yard uh, and that does have holes drilled directly into the rock with roll plugs placed in and that allows me to screw through the MDF from behind once it's all outside the vivarium and that'll provide firm anchorage into the stone so they're not falling off and then of course the more firmly anchored slate supports the weight from below so you know it's all despite how heavy it is it is all nicely taken care of and I'm not worried about it coming down and now for possibly the most important aspect and, and one that Joe's channel really does pride itself in is the heating and lighting. You know, I don't know of any other YouTube channel which prides itself so well in using an evidence based approach to heating and lighting your Vivaria. So, Joe, just give us a great rundown on what heating and lighting you have in this Vivarium. Well, I would definitely not say that I've mastered heating and lighting. Uh, the more and more that I'm learning about it, the more apparent that it's becoming that we still don't know how best to use the technology available to us as reptile and amphibian keepers to replicate sunlight. And so the rig that I've got in here is most definitely subject to change. But to give you the requested rundown of it, um, I've got two 6% T5 high output UVB lamps. I've got a 90 centimeter jungle dawn LED bar, um, a little um, 4 watt warm white LED, which is mainly for aesthetics, and also an 80 watt halogen flood lamp. The halogen flood lamp is taking the role of what most people would typically call a heat lamp. Now, I think I'm going to stop referring to these things as heat lamps because it actually takes away from what the purpose of this lamp actually is. Now, the reason that I'm saying this is that when you say heat lamp, you are suggesting that you are going to be using it for controlling temperatures. Now, if you do do this and you have the lamp on a dimming thermostat, what will happen when the lamp is dimmed is that it will, because it is acting as a black body, alter the spectrum of the radiation that it's given out. So if you've got your enclosure up to temperature and then the lamp dims and goes off, you are no longer offering the animals any of the near infrared, which is what this lamp is dedicated to provide. And so we don't necessarily want to be using these lamps to control temperatures. Now this does sort of add a little bit of confusion and it's a too big of a topic for me to discuss here so I will just introduce that and I'll let you watch the video that I'll produce on my channel when I get round to talking about this in full detail. 
I'd also like to note that the lamps are timed to come on in a staggered fashion such that the ones providing the longest wavelength radiation come on first and go off last. And so in effect what I am doing is replicating the changes in sunlight that will be observed out in nature. To this end, having the two separate UV lamps allows me to put one of the lamps on earlier than the other and going off later than the other, and so I am able to ramp up and down the UV indices more gradually than I would if I were to just have one lamp coming on in one set session. And with regards to those UV indices, when both of the UV lamps are on at the very middle of the day, the maximum UV index that the lizards are able to expose themselves to is about 10. Now immediately I will say that allowing your animals to get to a UVI of 10 could potentially be very, very dangerous indeed if they could not escape it. But in this enclosure with the background allowing the animals to crawl around as much as they can, they are more than able to move away from that and so I am not worried at all about providing them with it. It would of course only become a danger if they could not escape it. Now on the main basking platform the UV indices are about 6 to 7 and then as we move down the enclosure below the plants and so on it does go to absolute zero. This Joe is genuinely the best indoor setup I think I've ever seen and I think if more people sort of not only kept their lacertas like this but their amphibians and reptiles in general we would learn so much about their fascinating life cycles and it would really transform the relationship we have with our animals. So Joe, thank you for creating such an amazing piece of living art. Well, I'm certainly glad you like it. Let's just hope that the lizards do. As you can see these are some documents and we provide every single person with these documents especially when they are European protected species which the Lacerta Billionata are and so this just certifies that they've been captive bred by us and that now Joe is a proud owner of <laughs> one of our lizards. Yeah because I suppose that brings us on to the point of keeping these as well as it just being for our own interest there is a name for conservation exactly. here. Exactly. And this here is a certificate of outdoor breeding and raising and it just uh, proves to Joe that we have kept it outdoor, that they've had a natural diet and that they've been kept in the best way that we can possibly offer them. And this is just a reassurance to Joe that he's bought the rat from the right person, which is Celtic Reptile and Amphibian. And so if anything goes wrong, it's all my fault. <laughs> So this concludes our video on how to keep the western green lizards indoor properly and it's all thanks to this man here. Thank you very much. So we're uh, Celtic, yeah. thanks very much for turning up. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Uh, in this video I've been JTB Reptiles teaching you how to follow nature's example and I'll see you all in the next one. We and are Celtic Reptile and Amphibian, we'll see you in the next video. We'll link Joe's channel above. <laughs> <laughs> Ta-da!